Hey. Can folks hear me? Yep. Great. Great. I've been back and forth been between Hangouts and, and Zoom all morning, and sometimes the audio gets lost. So if you haven't uh, uh, sort of checked in in, in the uh, docs, uh, please uh, add yourself to the, to the docs. Uh, looking for two individuals, uh, uh, really, did not do a good job at uh, sort of capturing notes last last uh, session, and uh, apologize for that. Um, so, looking forward for two volunteers uh, to uh, you know focus on on minutes, uh, capturing some minutes, especially you know as we're getting uh, these use cases. I want to make sure we capture the questions and answers, uh, since uh, those will be sort of key things that will help us uh, build our case. Torn, are you presenting? Who's who's uh, uh, presenting on your side? You're on no. Jordan or Tim, who's who's presenting today? Yeah, I've got the slides. Cool. You want to uh, test your slides out while we're you know, waiting for folks to, to log on? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Dan, I think a couple of us are having issue accessing the doc. Uh, hmm. All right. Let me uh, make sure I give everybody the request for access. Google Docs. I think I've got every... Uh, should have open editing while we're live. Oh, I, I don't even have permission to, to view it. Yeah, me neither. Okay, no, no, no. It, it, there, there is an issue. It was closed to the group. Is any, any, anybody in uh, the domain had it um, on the web? There we go. All right. Sorry about that. There we go. Shane, you should have access now. Torn. Okay. So for everyone's logging on, uh, you know, it, uh, I've got in the chat uh, the uh, meeting notes. Uh, please add yourself. Uh, I can I can volunteer to take some. Great, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, could I get uh, someone else to to help uh, support Torn? One more volunteer. We'll get started. 
I can help take notes. But, Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I don't have, okay. That's you have access. Yeah, I'm. I'm going through. You know, I, I'm going through and adding everybody in the sort of cumbersome uh, uh, Google Docs process of adding people. All right. So continuing uh, today with with our use cases, uh, we have. Uh, the OPA uh, use case that we're going to dive into. Uh, thanks again to, to Sri for sharing the um, the Cloud Foundry use case. Uh, that was a, a great discussion and uh, you know really insightful to, to uh, you know get that context. And you know we had a, a number of folks who who've had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with the uh, OPA, and uh, so we, we wanted to to take uh, the full session today to uh, you know. Go through the the use cases and uh, you know hear a bit about uh, of the, the journey of the, that uh, the team uh, you know, behind OPA has been uh, uh, going through, and uh, uh, you'll go through some some questions and answers today. So uh, um, I forget who's got uh, Tim. Is that that you has the uh, slides up? Sorry. Yep. yep. All right. So Tim, uh, go ahead. Take it away. Okay. Thanks. So. Um so what I thought I'd do is spend a, a few minutes just giving a, a quick overview of OPA and sort of setting the stage there and then, and then talking just a little bit about uh, the, 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 the process, the journey, as you say, that we've gone through and then, and then diving into the use cases. I'm, obviously, that's the meat of the, the discussion, but I thought we should set the stage a bit first. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, the first thing that, that I think the, is to mention is just sort of the goal of OPA, right? The goal of OPA has always been to make it easy to add rich policy support um, to other projects and services, right? That's been the goal. I think of OPA as sort of like a library in that sense. Um, but, but the idea is really that you've got, like as this picture shows, uh, what we expect to hap have happen is that OPA is running in, in, in a bunch of different places. Um, and you know, those OPAs are integrated with different kinds of systems, like maybe in the, in the microservice case, you've integrated OPA with all the different microservices that are running, uh, or maybe you're integrating OPA into different components of Kubernetes or into Linux or into uh, uh, all kinds of different places. And we'll go into what some of those use cases are and what, what people have found OPA useful for. Um, but then the idea is that we want to make OPA really easy to, to use and take sort of zero runtime dependencies. It's always been one of the goals to make it very easy to integrate, very easy to deploy. Um, and then the idea behind OPA is that it's really intended to be something that can make policy decisions for something running right next to it, right? So we like to think of this as like a host local kind of daemon that knows how to make authorization or, or more generally policy decisions for anything that's running on that host. But the goal of OPA is never to, has never been to be a service. It's never... Uh, it's always just designed to be basically a library or something that answers answers questions for, from services that are sitting on the host. And so the sort of uh, the sort of management of how you integrate and, and deal with multiple OPAs has always been and an, uh, out of scope for OPA. And so I think you know from my understanding of what Safe is is designing to do, um, this this seems like a, a natural fit for 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 Safe. Um, all right. So I think that was the, the goal. Um, I will say, oh, I'll skip to some of this. Uh, everybody here knows uh, roughly what the policy problem is, I'm assuming. And so one of the things that OPA does provide is a declarative language that was designed to work fundamentally with JSON data. We'll see uh, some examples and use cases there. I already went through this. It's a library daemon. It's all written in Go. So if you want to integrate as a library, you've got to use, you've got to have your system, your, your service written in Go. Um, all, all storage of, of data and policy, all of that is done in memory. Right, and so a, and so having a, a management piece that is is capable of actually feeding OPA uh, those policies and, and any data it needs is is, is valuable there. Uh, we've done a bunch of work around uh, tooling as well. So OPA has you know a, a REPL, a, a, an environment where you can go into and, and run uh, and ask for the results of evaluating ad hoc queries or, or just running uh, the, the policy even without having deployed it. There's a test framework for writing unit tests. There's tracing to do debuggability. Uh, and, and we're working on some profiling stuff to look at performance. Um, we are working on a standard library as well so that you don't have to write policies from scratch. You go and you pull them in and, and, uh, and immediately you're up and running um, uh, without even necessarily having to write policy. Uh, and then what we're going to do is, is, for the most part, focus on a bunch of these integrations today. Um, any questions so far? Sounds good. 
All right, I'll keep, I'll keep hammering away. Okay, so um, the, conceptually the way that, the, the, that OPA works is that remember the goal of OPA is to add policy support to an existing project or service. And so here we have sort of a pictorial representation of that. So we have some service, it doesn't matter what it is, maybe it's a microservice, maybe it's Kubernetes, maybe it's uh, Kafka. And then what you do is you, uh, there's an API that OPA exposes so that that service can ask for uh, policy decisions, for, for enforcement decisions. So the idea is that the service anytime it, it needs an authorization decision. It just it opens up a, a simple HTTP request and asks OPA for that decision. Independently, there's a management API that's used for OPA, and through that API, you actually provide uh, OPA with two different conceptual pieces of information. One is logic. This is sort of like the policy that you would expect, right? Allow this user to to run this API call under these conditions. That's kind of the logic. We we, we use Rego. That's the language for expressing that logic. Um, and then in addition though, you can, you can provide OPA with arbitrary JSON data. And so typically what this data represents is something that's happening in the world. So in the Kubernetes case, this might be all the, all the pods that exist. Um, or in the, in the microservice case, maybe the data is you know, something like your org chart so that you know who's a manager of whom. All right, and so these are the two kinds of APIs that OPA exposes. Uh, the, the, um, uh, and in particular, they're both sort of initiated by, by things outside of OPA. So today, uh, the service is the thing that initiates the, the request. It says, OPA, tell me what a decision is. Um, and likewise, on the management side, there's some external management system that needs to actually push that logic and that data into OPA. And so what we end up doing, at least uh, for some of the integrations, for some of the use cases that we've done, is that we've added a service-specific management sidecar to OPA. So for example, with Kubernetes, what we've done is there's a, there's a sidecar that runs next to, to OPA that, that goes and pulls policies out of the Kubernetes API server and pushes them into OPA. And likewise, that Kube uh, sidecar will go off and grab, let's say, all of the pods that are currently running the API server and push that as data into, into OPA. And so that's sort of the, you know, the division that we saw earlier, which is that OPA is really intended to be this post-local policy engine that makes decisions. Uh, that's a completely separate from, from the management piece. All right, questions about that? Yes, I have a question. Um, you, you mentioned that you um, pull the policies out of the Kubernetes API server. Are those the RBAC policies? So do you essentially have an, an enforcement for RBAC policies in OPA? Uh, oh, not today, not today. Uh, we could, uh, certainly. We, and in fact, Torin did the did translation of, uh, he had a, a collection of RBAC policies and showed how you could write them in OPA. Uh, we didn't automate that. It's all in Torin's head. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we've, we've definitely talked about uh, adding that kind of functionality where you could take an existing policy language and then sort of compile it down into, into OPAs. But what, the, but, but what we did do, uh, or what, what exists, is called the Kube Management, uh, it's in the Kube Management repo within the Open Policy Agent GitHub org. Uh, what that actually does is it, it, is it pulls um, OPA policies out of a config map inside of Kubernetes and then pushes them into OPA. So the, the, the way that you sort of use uh, OPA for at, least a Kubernetes, for at least a couple of the Kubernetes use cases is that you write your policy and you push it in as config maps. Ah, okay, 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 thanks. Yeah, anything else? Okay, um, so I, I mentioned the APIs in the last slide, and so I figured, especially given some of the interest of this group, it was worth spending a couple minutes just talking about what, what APIs OPA supports today. Uh, to give you a, a, a better feel for this. Um, so really there are two kinds of APIs that OPA supports. Um, here on the, the top four are really the management API that I spoke about. And then there's really one, at least there's one main one for doing, for doing enforcement, right? So uh, on the, well, I guess I'll, I should start with the management. The, the, the really, uh, in the management API, there's really just CRUD on policies. That's the first two lines. And then there's CRUD on data. Right, so remember for us, we've got these two things that come in, the, the, the policies and the data. And so really there's just, you know, sort of standard management APIs for, for, for dealing with both the management and data, getting them in and, and out and updating them within OPA. So those are the first four APIs. And then the fifth API is really the one that asks for, for, a, for a policy decision, right? And here the idea is just uh, basically open up a GET request. And uh, so all, all that the, the, the service needs to do is run a GET request on, on basically a, a URL that uh, names the policy that they want the decision from, okay? And so 
it's, it's really pretty much that simple in terms of the, the API. The one thing I'll mention here that, that, um, that's noteworthy in this sort of REST API space is that all of the policies and all of the data are registered at human readable path names. So like when you create a policy, you can create it at foo slash bar slash baz. Um, in the API, and then that's reflected in the, in the policy language as well. The same is true of data. You can register data at whatever, uh, whatever path you like. Uh, and then decisions are also named via paths. So you could ask for a decision, which is like, you know, decision slash, um, slash microservice slash app A, uh, and then you get the decisions uh, that are for the policy that's registered at that point. Any, any questions there? The only other thing I would throw in is just that like those policy decisions, when you, when you get them, you can provide arbitrary JSON input um, when you ask for those decisions. So like you can represent, you know, the API request that you want to authorize or, or whatever as JSON and you just pass that in, in, in the body of the post request. Yeah, and it turns out that the, I mean, I can't remember if I mentioned the, the term domain agnostic here, but uh, in, the, in the intro to OPA, but, but the idea behind OPA is that it should work for any kind of domain that we like. Uh, and in order to make that happen, sort of the, the what ends up uh, working is that when you pass a, a, a when you make a when a service makes a decision a request for a decision from OPA, the input that it provides can be any arbitrary JSON document, and that's how OPA achieves this domain agnosticity, if that's a word. Uh, the idea being that because you can pass in any arbitrary input, that input could represent the a microservice API call, such as the method path and user, or it could represent a, a request to do SSH, which is here's the host ID and the user, or it could represent um, a Terraform plan. Uh, and we'll see examples of all these things uh, shortly. Does OPA support um, uh, approaches for validating data? So for example, if I'm passing a JOT, can you, can you, can you do the validation on that? Yeah, so. Or do you, you implicitly oh, trust the service? I, so yeah, typically the way that we think about it is that we do, uh, trust the input that comes in. We assume that there's some sort of trusted tunnel between the, the service and OPA. Um, but specifically with respect to JOTS, I'll mention that uh, we have been asked a couple of times to, to, to add enough functionality inside of OPA to actually do that kind of validation uh, in the policy itself. Uh, and then the policy language itself today already has uh, enough control to be able to like inspect the internals of a JOT token to make policy decisions uh, using the, the information contained within that token. How are the OPA uh, APIs itself for the policy de decision secured? Like, how do you authenticate the service itself, which is calling into the OPA decision API? So today we have bearer tokens, uh, if you want to do that. Typically what we, you know, or at least often what we do is we just, um, um, we just sort of assume that there's a trusted tunnel there. But yeah, bearer tokens are what exists. Yeah, so a lot of cases open is running locally on the host next to next to the service that it's policy enabling. So we, we assume that like localhost is secure. Uh, you can run OPA, the OPA server with TLS enabled. Uh, if you want to like you need to encrypt the traffic. Uh, like Tim said, you can configure OPA with uh, bearer tokens for authentication. Um, and then obviously uh, OPA would not be complete if you couldn't write authorization policy over the OPA APIs uh, themselves. Uh, so you can do that as well. So you have you know, support for TLS, authentication, and authorization on OPA uh, itself. And then some people have been asking about support for like mutual TLS authentication when talking to OPA, and so that's sort of on the roadmap. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, it felt like especially for this kind of topic, it was worth spending one minute talking about uh, the journey that we've taken to get here and, and where we are. Um, and so, you know, we started OPA roughly two years ago in, let's say, 2016, and we spent basically the first year building the, the basic OPA, the language, the, the API, and so on and so forth. Last year, we spent basically the whole year uh, investigating how to use OPA to solve other people's real-world problems, right, and building the community around OPA and, and, and getting it out, and then taking what we would learned by running through uh, uh, numerous use cases to sort of help climb the language and the implementation and the API. Um, and now this year, really, our focus is on uh, is on like hardening. So we're looking at building a V2 of the language uh, with you know some of the folks that I know were I saw on on one of the docs, uh, uh, Sarah and, and Tristan uh, out of Google. So they're very interested in, in working with us on uh, on the V2 of the language. 
Um, and then we're also looking at, uh, so trying to improve the ease of use of the language, make it a little bit more programmer friendly, looking at performance, and then, of course, continuing to solve uh, real-world problems, right, and building community. So what we thought we would do for the rest of the talk is just go through some of the use cases that we've, that we've used uh, OPA to solve um, from, from a number of different places. All right. All right, so here's our, here's our picture of um, the, 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 the classes of different use cases that, that we've used to, with, with, to, that we solved with OPA. Um, and, and so uh, we're going to go through, I think, most of these. I'll just highlight them, you know, so, so really remember OPA is designed to be domain agnostic, which means you can apply it at really any level of, of your, your proverbial stack, right? So we've applied OPA sort of at the orchestration layer here with Kubernetes, uh, at the individual sort of host layer to do um, uh, like uh, Docker and Linux uh, uh, control. Uh, we've done integrations with OPA at the sort of public cloud layer with, with Terraform to do some risk management. Uh, we've done, uh, we solved use cases with OPA at the microservice API layer as well. Um, that, that's been pretty public around, uh, we've been probably most public around that with Netflix and Istio. Um, and then we've recently, we started getting into, or not us necessarily, but users have started uh, using OPA to do some data protection stuff uh, in the sort of Kafka open SDS and, and Minio space. All right, so I'm just going to go through some of these. Um, and, uh, and the ones, and, and try to, I, I, what I tried to do is sort of just, I know, we can't go through all 20 or however many integrations, but, but go through sort of the, the, the key categories of integrations that we've done in use cases that we've seen. The interesting thing, uh, I did spend some time uh, for this meeting trying to think through some of the different dimensions that we think about um, when we're looking at a new use case. And, and, and so we thought that this would be valuable for this for this uh, group, just because it does, does sort of highlight some of the different things that you need to think about when you're thinking about a use case, at least, at least in, our, in our experience as a case. So I'll, I'll just run through these one at a time and then very quickly, but then what I'd like to understand is from, the, from this group's position, like what, what, which of these things are most interesting to you? Uh, and then I can sort of highlight those and, as we talk to you in the different use cases. So the first one is just sort of basic policy, like what kind of policy we're even writing? Um, and, and obviously, this is really interesting from an OPA point of view because it, you know, OPA is fundamentally a, a language. And so understanding what kinds of policy and what kinds of expressiveness requirements are, are needed is, is an important uh, uh, property of any use case. The second thing is data and context. And this is typically, you know, uh, from OPA's point of view, data represents uh, what's going on in the world. And so sometimes in order to make policy decisions, you need information that the requester does not provide. For example, in the microservice API case, if you want to authorize an API server, or sorry, an API request, you may need to know uh, whether the user that's making that request is a manager in the organization, right? And that management information is not always something that comes in as part of the request. Uh, so what data and context you need to actually make decisions is valuable. The third thing here is what, what, do, the, this, what do the decisions look like? You know, classically with authorization policies, the decision is always true, false, it's loud and I. Maybe there are a couple others like not applicable, but, but fundamentally they're you know, often allowed and I. Uh, and, and one of the things that we, we uh, uh, built into OPA from the very early days was the, was the ability to make decisions that were not just allow and deny statements. You can return decisions that are numbers. That, for example, you want to do rate limiting or strings um, or sets or even dictionaries. And there are use cases uh, throughout that, that will show each of those. Um, the next thing is integration. You know, in some sense, you're always at the mercy of the system you're trying to integrate with uh, when, when it comes to actually doing the integration. So, so how does that even work? And that's something that we look at for each and every use case. And it's always a little bit different. Policy management is the obvious thing that we mentioned earlier, which is that every use case, uh, at least for OPA, uh, requires a, a potentially a different kind of management uh, uh, system. Uh, and then there's performance. It turns out that use cases can vary widely in terms of performance. We've got some use cases where, you know, spending 10 seconds to make a policy decision is fine. Others where you, you have to come in at, at, at under, you know, a millisecond if you're gonna, if you're gonna make a decision. Uh, and then finally is a, a terribly named here, unfortunately, mode. But here the idea is that there are different ways of actually uh, enforcing policy. One is the sort of obvious one, which is that you, we call it pro proactive here, which is that you stop policy violations before they happen, right? Um, uh, for example, you don't deploy, you don't allow a pod to be deployed on Kubernetes unless uh, the policy says it's okay to deploy. But there's this other version, which is what we're calling reactive, which is that you look at the state of the world and you say, here are 
violations of policy, now I'm gonna go off and fix them, right? And now this is actually more common than you would think. Like imagine in Kubernetes, you actually change your policy and now you've got a bunch of pods that violated that policy. Do you wanna go off and fix them or do you not, right? The third kind of thing here is audit. So here the idea is, well, let's go off and actually just identify violations and then use them and then plug into some external system to actually let people know that there are actually violations in place. Okay. Other questions or comments here? Oh, th right, and, and let me know which things are most important to, to you. Yeah. No opinions? How, like, when, when you're in that um, you know, decommissioning state, uh of of pods you know how how easy it is is it to um leave those things behind you know that's been a uh, a pain point you know i haven't experienced that in kubernetes but uh uh you know in sort of other orchestration systems uh you know having uh decommissioned uh you know nodes in there that uh um, you know, have the wrong policy. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you're 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 pulling your hair out, you're pulling your hair out, and it's oh my god! And like we thought it was, you know, that those nodes were gone, and they're they're still there doing the wrong things. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what one of the sort of one of our goals with OPA has always been this idea that you ought to be able to write a single policy and then apply it in any of these different modes, uh, or at least you know to the extent that you can make that happen, and so. Um, at least with, with, you know, Kube, the nice thing is that once you sort of get, this sort of pull all of the data about the current state of the world, so whether it's pods or nodes or whatever, into, into OPA, uh, as we've already articulated, then the, the, the language itself was sort of designed around a, the notion of a query language. And so you can just ask the question, well, like, tell me which pods and nodes exist that, that shouldn't, right? And then you can even set up watches that, you know, stream the results uh, of that query back out to you. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and you push that into a dashboard. So I, I, I guess I don't know how to answer your question except to answer it with the way OPA would, the way we would use OPA to help uh, with that kind of problem. Cool. Okay, well, I guess as we go, th sorry, go ahead. Oh. Reasonable answer. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted, this is Sarah from Google. Um, and one of the things that I, I think is exciting about OPA from my perspective is the ability to compose policy that um, might be from disparate services that, that need to work together, or we need to reason about them together. Um, but part of the safe working group is to zoom out a bit and say, well, we have a whole system that might be using OPA for in one place and something else in another, and how do we reason about the overall system architecture and policies writ large? And so I'm curious about, you know, what your thought of, you know, if, we're in a situation where like everybody in the world isn't going to use OPA. What are the things that we as a working group might need to define that would help OPA live within an ecosystem that is heterogeneous? Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously the, you know, their standards things would help here, right? Like, um, so like having a fairly simple and standard way to ask for decisions, I guess, would help. I mean, it, it would definitely help the, the so maybe I, I'll answer this from the, the user's point of view, like, which is that as a user, I'd like to have a consistent way of managing and dealing with all these different kinds of policy systems. Um, what I'd really like, though, is to be able to reason about how the different policies, presumably in different languages, would interact with each other. And it's not clear to me what you can do do there from a from an outside like if we treat all policy languages as block boxes and it's not clear to me what you can do there other than to have other than to maybe surface actual policy decisions in some sort of um, format that you know some tooling could come along later and and sort of combine them um, well, I think one of the things that, like, sort of, I have a hypothesis that you know, like, that that generally we are all kind of dealing with the same nouns and verbs for the most part. Certainly, the same nouns, right? So there might be some certain amount of um, where we say, okay, if you're develop, if you're deploying an app, right, or or microservice, 
in you're in this world of deploying software that interoperates with other software via, you know, TCP IP. <laughs> There's some set of concerns that you have. And if we were to standardize like words for those concerns or APIs to in query, um, you know, or something, then you could imagine people being able to compare equivalent policies, right? Obviously, if some um, policy system has capabilities that another policy system doesn't, that's one thing. But what I hear from people who have these heterogeneous infrastructure environments is there, you know, they want to do something as simple as like, I want to know that, um, you know, these, uh, these, these endpoints aren't open to the world and mm -hmm. I can't even, I have to write different code for each system to even ask very simple questions. And, you know, and I don't know whether that's, you know, what, what form that takes, but I think that we have this dream of, like you say, like having tools that would be able to say, okay, I can go across all of these systems and um, without writing something that is custom for every system that I work with, I know that if it conforms to the, to the safe guidelines, right, that then my, this tool will be interoperable in some way. Yeah, and what I, what I wonder, I mean, we've, we've talked about this in the past, which is that it would be nice, it would be wonderful if there were some ontology, some schema that everyone in the world agreed on and that like represented all, let's see, let me go back, represented all the nouns in the, you know, in this landscape that we see here. And I think what I've, I've been hesitant to try to go down that road just because it seems, it feels to me like a, like a, such a gigantic undertaking and that will never be finished. Uh, and so what I, what, what, what I think I would, I would wonder about is how do we scope what you're talking about to, to something where uh, it's like, it's doable, it's, it's, and, and yet valuable at the same time. And so like, I think maybe the right thing to do is to, to do that from a, from a use case perspective and, and, you know, tackle one use case at a time. And once we're happy with that, then, then go on to the next. And it's not clear to me, uh, what else can be done there when it comes to, you know, standardizing the, the, the nouns at, you know, across systems as, 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 as uh, widely disparate as the, the ones that are, that we use every day. Yeah. I mean, I think there's models for that out there in the world, you know, like how do we get to really standard MIME types for email, right? Like there's processes that where um, we've done this on the internet before where we start with a few and, there's ways to promote something to be what everybody uses. Um, and that, that's, that could be an exercise for the working group. Mm -hmm. It's painful consensus, but that's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that what we're hearing is that even a few common mm -hmm. things right. would be high value to the people using these systems, right? Because a lot of the auditing requires either some kind of manual inspection or custom code to, and then that's always worrisome and fragile. Yeah, some folks in the, the IBM team were, were sharing how in OpenStack, this was just left to vendors and you know the incompatibility was uh, incredibly cumbersome. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, an opportunity. All right, uh, so this seems good. Should, uh, maybe I should hammer on and actually talk about some use cases. What do we think? <laughs> uh, okay, so, all right, so, okay, the first one we're gonna talk about here is Kube, and I'll just kind of rattle on through some of this stuff, uh, and then stop me with questions. Uh, I'll try to remember to ask, but if I don't, just jump in. Okay, so Kubernetes, uh, we've done actually a number, we've seen actually a number of different use cases actually within Kubernetes itself, because there are a number of different places uh, that are extensible enough to, to support a, a policy system. Um, and so, you know, at, at one point, uh, we, we, have, we have an integration with the, the federation control plane. So here the problem, the policy problem is really uh, given a new workload, tell uh, OPA decides which, uh, cl which Kubernetes clusters to place that workload on, right? So that's the use case. Uh, there are others at, at the API server level around authorization and admission control. Here the idea is somebody's trying to create a new pod, and now OPA needs to decide either whether to allow it in or not, um, or uh, it, 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 we've used OPA to actually define the mutations that need to happen to that pod before it's, before it's let through. 
Um, and then in the, in the scheduler, we did, a, we did an integration there as well to actually use policy to control effectively uh, which, to, to filter out which nodes are not, uh, are not used during scheduling. Um, okay, so we've got more details on these. Uh, the one that we, get, we have more details on uh, right here in the slide deck is admission control. Uh, so here the idea is you've got this, uh, this pod effectively that we're trying to, to, uh, to create there on the right hand side. And then the way that that works is that there's a webhook that runs inside the API server. And the, the nice thing is here that it's a generic webhook. And so, you know, we didn't actually have to go in and, and, and convince uh, Kubernetes to, to talk to OPA. We could just set up OPA as a, as a webhook. Um, and then, so then uh, I guess the, the examples here that we're showing are that uh, some of the policies that people like are, well, make sure that labels exist, like every pod has a contact email address. Uh, control the number of replicas uh, based on the type of application, the type of pod that we're deploying. Uh, make sure that uh, there's certain metadata in place for the template. Uh, the other one that we've heard several times is let's use, uh, let's make sure that all the images in this pod come from a trusted uh, repository, like if, we're, if this is a production cluster. So those are just some of the, the use cases that we've seen there. Oh, here, uh, I think maybe I'll skip through this. I don't think people uh, here are gonna care too much about the language. I will mention though that, that the, let me see, the, yeah, here, the, that the input that comes in to OPA when it makes a decision is the, this gigantic YAML thing shown here on the left, right? It is the full pod definition. And uh, for the people who, who know uh, Kubernetes RBOC, this is what, in some sense, what differentiates OPA from RBOC is that when you make policy decisions, you get to make them given the entire pod uh, that's trying, that somebody's trying to create, all right? And then as I mentioned here, the, the decision uh, in this case could just be true or false. It's, it's, it's allowed or it's not, but it could also be um, uh, sort of a, a JSON dictionary that defines what amounts to a JSON patch uh, for updates that must be applied to this pod before it's, uh, before it's admitted. Questions there? Okay, here, uh, uh, following on this interest in use cases, here are a few other uh, example policies that we've heard people uh, use in the, in the Kubernetes admission control space. Um, I'm not gonna, re I'll, I'll just let you all uh, sort of scan through those quickly. I won't bother reading them. Yeah, and we can post the slides to this uh, online after the meeting and then throw them into the notes. Um, people wanna go through this. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll follow up and send that out to everybody. Yeah, all right. Um, okay, I uh, just checked the time. We've got about 20 minutes left. I will skip reading through these things. I'll just pick out a couple of highlights. Uh, in terms of management, we've already discussed how OPA handles management within Kubernetes, right? We have the sidecar that pulls policies out of config maps and pushes Kubernetes data into OPA. Uh, we actually have looked at this for both the proactive, reactive, as well as audit perspectives. Um, I think we covered the rest of this here. All right, so let's go on. All right, so another use case, uh, and this, this we've seen quite a bit of, of interest in. This is sort of microservice API authorization. Um, so the idea here, the problem that we're solving is that you've got a whole collection of microservices that are doing what they do, and now we need to add authorization on top of it. And the idea being here that each and every API call that a microservice sees is something that it sends to OPA to ask for an authorization decision on. Right, um, and so conceptually, the way that you should think about this is that OPA is running on the same host as every microservice, um, and so the the nice thing then is that you get uh, high performance and high availability. Right, you're not paying a network hop to go hit some external service to get an authorization decision. Um, and now, uh, and now the idea is that you're using OPA to make those decisions um, on every API call. Uh, there are different ways of integrating OPA with those microservices. Uh, some, some, right, from top to bottom, some folks will actually just do a direct integration with OPA or uh, what we just released, I think this week, was a spring integration where uh, even the developer doesn't even know that OPA is being used, but, but the Java framework is actually taking every API call and authorizing it with OPA. Uh, some folks will actually embed OPA as a library into the microservice. That's the second one. The third one from the top is effectively the service mesh 
uh, version where you run next to your microservice a sidecar, which is a network proxy that, that handles all the network traffic. And then what we do is an integration with that, with that proxy um, so that that proxy actually asks OPA for authorization decisions on every API call. Uh, there's another version of, in the SDO world where OPA was integrated into Mixer, uh, and so it can do centralized decisions there as well. Um, and then the last one here, I think we're just illustrating the fact that if you've got multiple microservices running on a single host, they can all use the same OPA. And so then uh, here, the interesting bit for this use case is here are the inputs that come in. As I mentioned earlier, you can provide a path and a method and a source and a target and a user. And then the policy that you write makes a decision about whether or not that API call is authorized. Questions here? Um, looking at the sort of uh, the, the, the dimensions of comparison that we talked about earlier, uh, the performance on this one is, cr is critical, right? So if you're uh, the Netflix, the, the number that Netflix came out with was uh, actually twice this. So 2000 requests per second is what you need. Um, and then at least for them. And so like obviously the, and, and I guess I didn't mention this previously, but in Kubernetes, the, the number was more like a second, right? Or a 10th of a second, something like that. And so obviously the performance demands in this use case are, are significantly different. Um, but, and, and so consequently there, there we, we ended up uh, adding some functionality to OPA to handle these really mission critical, performance critical applications. Um, uh, and, and, and so that was just something that we needed to do. The other thing that we see is that for these uh, kinds of use cases where performance is critical. It also turns out that the amount of data that they typically use is smaller uh, and the and the policies are written are, are typically much simpler as well. Um, these decisions are basically allow and deny true false the classic authorization decisions. Uh, and we've seen people either do these integrations with a go library running it as a uh, as a daemon uh, or the, the other integrations that we talked about with the service meshes. Um, so this yeah, Sorry, question. I, I see that you have a translation into Rig there. So what, what, what's the reason for that? What, what is the other language? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this was interesting. So this has come up uh, several times over the last couple of months where people want to use OPA for this, for this particular use case. But what they want to do is sort of split off. Um, think of this as maybe a service graph. Um, uh, like, so they've got some YAML file that represents a service graph. And what they want to do is basically treat that as the actual policy. Um, and so then what happens is that the, you end up writing a little bit of, of Rego. Rego is the internal OPA language. So you end up writing a little bit of Rego to actually uh, de define the semantics of that YAML data. And then when OPA is making the decision, um, it will sort of combine that YAML data, which defines, let's say, the service graph, along with the, the, the Rego that defines its semantics in order to make a decision. Now, this translated into Rego just means that the, one, of the, one of the features that we added recently to OPA will take the data and the, and the, the, the YAML and the Rego and, and compile them down into, into pure Rego uh, and written in a simple form that we can, that we can evaluate uh, very quickly. So that's the idea there. That, that in this use case, it seems like uh, people want to have a, a, a sort of a secondary front end to, to writing policy, which amounts to YAML or sort of a GUI. Uh, and then what they want to do is make that very easy for, for, for users or application developers to write. Uh, and then at the same time, they want to use OPA to actually do the enforcement. So yeah, we can, we'll also maybe post a link to the, to the. Yeah, so I've added, a, I've added a link to the bottom. Uh, that partially y'all feature that Tim's sending out. And I think that, like, yeah, so the idea here is, like, you know, the, the, the developers want to provide, like, RBAC configuration, basically, you know, to, to the system. Um, but the, the platform engineer, the security team building the security platform wants to use OPA to use all those, those RBAC uh, policies. And so uh, that's something that, that's, like, well supported today, and we're sort of continuing to, to like, partner and optimize for. Yeah. Um, when it comes to management in this case, um, Netflix ended up rolling their own, um, their own management layer. They, you know, Netflix is good at, at replicating state and policy is an example of that. So they rolled their own and I know is, I don't know if Manish is on the call or not. I saw his name on the, on the, 
folks in the, in the working group. Um, but they rolled their own. Um, uh, the other thing that we've seen in this is using, uh, for Istio, uh, using uh, Kubernetes CRD, uh, custom resource definitions to, uh, to store policy as well as data. Um, that's something that I think we're, that, that may be coming out as part of Istio in the near future. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen in terms of management is we've seen several, we've seen several requests for um, sort of backends that will have OPA go out and like pull policy out of Postgres or S3 or something like that. Uh, and so like the, the management there is, 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 is uh, goes beyond what OPA does for sure, but it's, it's a fairly simple kind of uh, sidecar uh, management system. All right, we'll keep on moving then. Um, the, the, another use case that was interesting here is in uh, sort of public cloud space. Um, and this one is really focused on Terraform and, and using Terraform uh, to manage the public cloud resources. So there were actually kind of two use cases that came out here. Uh, so um, what happened was that uh, there are really two cases, right? So one of which is you've got an application developer uh, who, or, or a platform engineer who wants to make a change to the public cloud infrastructure. So they go into Terraform, they make some changes to the file, and then, and then they want to go ahead and apply those changes. And so what it was Medallia. So what Medallia wanted to do was take the plan that Terraform produces and compute a risk score for that plan and then decide whether or not that user is authorized to make that change all by himself without peer review based on the risk score of the plan as well as based on how senior a, 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 an employee they were, right? So if you're a senior platform engineer, then your risk score might, might be like a thousand um, and you can make any change up to that risk score. But if you're a junior developer, maybe you're only authorized uh, to automatically execute risk scores under 100 or something. And here, the risk score that they came up with was based on the, 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 the networking ports that you open, the number of servers that you deleted, and so on and so forth. So this is, we, we did convince them to add this risk score um, um, policy to, to our standard library. So that's out there in existence. Um, the second kind of use case is sort of the back end of that, which is once you've already uh, used Terraform to push uh, and manage your public cloud resources, how do you know that people are only using Terraform to actually manage that infrastructure? And here the idea was that what, what, what Manali did was they took the, uh, the I think it was AWS, they took the AWS, the state of AWS, all the resources in it, and then they took uh, the Terraform state file, which represents what resources Terraform knows is under its management. It, it taught, uh, the, you toss both of those into OPA, and then you write policy that, uh, that look for differences, right? That say, show me a resource in the public cloud that is not also in the Terraform state. Um, and so they're using that for, for audit. Okay. Questions about those use cases? All right, uh, maybe to ground that, I do have an example here of the kind of input uh, that would come in uh, that would uh, actually ask for, a, a, in this case, a risk score uh, for this particular Terraform plan. And so there was no way, I, I don't know if any of you have seen Terraform plans, but there's no way I could actually put on a slide. So there's a whole bunch of ellipses here. Um, but, but you get the basic idea that there are, that, that, that it is pretty much a, an arbitrary JSON document uh, that tell you all the different properties that are being changed, and then you've got to write some some sort of policy logic that decides how risky that changes. Here uh, and here, the, the decision here is a number. It's a you know some sort of risk score. Uh, oh, and here here I broke down the the sort of two Terraform use cases in terms of of these dimensions of comparison that we talked about. Uh, performance here was not a real issue. Um, you know, it's it's some person using it for the most part, so it's not a big deal. Um, and then obviously here though, the policies were, were quite sophisticated in terms of the kinds of inputs they required and in terms of, and, and in terms of the expressiveness you needed to actually compute a risk score. Decision was a number, we talked about that. Um, the, we don't really have good visibility into how they're doing policy management um, in either of these cases. But, uh, but what seems sort of clear is that there aren't a thousand OPAs that they're using, there's you know, one or two or 10. Uh, so management's probably not all that. Uh, okay, we did all that. All right, great. 
Any other questions about the Terraform use case? Okay. Uh, moving on then, uh, this is a, actually a recent category uh, and we don't have as much data here, but, the, but recently folks have been starting to use OPA to do data protection. Here we've got a couple of examples, uh, OpenSDS, uh, Minio is new and Kafka is new. Um, so all of those. So, and in fact, there's, um, so I, I don't have a ton to say here other than what I try to do is again, uh, talk through the, how each of these use cases uh, uh, course, correspond to those, those early dimensions that we talked about. Oh, and there's another one here, rate limiting that I didn't have on the, that I didn't have on the graphic. This is also new. Um, so for the rate limiting use case, the idea is that somebody wants to set up uh, policies to control network rate limits. Um, and so we're still not quite sure exactly what they're, what they're doing there, but what we do expect is that the, the performance is pretty high. Again, this is sort of close to the microservice API case. Um, and again, they're doing this thing that, that Torin talked about, or I guess I mentioned it too, where they, they have a GUI or a, or a YAML file for, for writing the sort of the core, the crux of the policy that people care about, and then they're effectively uh, treating that as data when they author policy. Uh, in Rego. Here, obviously, the decision's a number, uh, and the policy management we know is going to be custom. Uh, data protection is pretty similar here. I don't think there's anything new. Again, performance is going to be key. Um, decisions are typically allowed an eye, as far as we can tell in this case. Uh, I have a basic question. I mean, we're going through like a, diff a lot of use cases. There are different resources outlined there. Um, does OPA have like a specific schema for how resources are uh, identified and, you know, like basically defined and, you know, like how attributes are set for those resources or is it like very open-ended? It's like a JSON data file that gets uploaded and then you, um, you know, like write a policy on that. Yep, yep, it, it's the latter. So we do not impose a schema um, on anyone. And, you know, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, I, like, I, I wouldn't know how to begin that, right? And so what we did instead is what you, what you mentioned second, which is the, the input that you provide to OPA is any arbitrary JSON document. And then in the policy language, you know what that schema is going to be when you're writing policy, and then you express the logic that makes whatever decision you need it to make. Um, there in the in the policy language. So there's sort of basically a contract with, between the, the 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 person who is setting up enforcement and doing that integration and the person writing policy. So that once the, the the integration for enforcement is done, then you know the schema that you're writing policy over. And how does the user identity itself come into the policy decision uh, making? Like, so you can write policies wherein you know, like you have example policies wherein you have a user right uh, mm -hmm. for which that policy is applicable but um in in a real life use case like how how would how does the user um context flow into the policy like like typical example like how did netflix do it or in in the kubernetes example yeah so the the the, the standard way for for uh, is to use something like a jot right so i mean that's sort of a, a an obvious way of doing this right so you have the user authenticate through a jot and then you pass that jot into opa opa does have support uh special support for jots so that you can go and inspect the internals and um and yeah and then we're we've, we've had a couple of requests to actually be able to validate tokens uh within the policy so um but in those cases, we haven't sort of um, made a, again, it's the same sort of question as the first, which is we don't require any sort of authentication scheme. Uh, uh, it's pretty open-ended right now, so you can pass in tokens as part of the input here, right? Just imagine there's another field in this input document that's like called token. Um, and, so, and so in that sense, we sort of uh, assume that the, the, the user has solved authentication in some way, shape, or form, and that they have a trusted channel to ask for decisions from OPA, and so they can provide that user in however they, however they like. Um, and then again, when you're writing policy, you know how that user is, is, is being represented. Yeah. So, so like in the, in the case of Spring, for example, like they, they have a whole way of representing user like details, basically, right? And so we just take that, that object, we just like send, send it into OPA as, as JSON, right? And so then you get, you know, you, you know whether or not like the account is locked or like whatever the attributes are that they define on like the sub or on the principle, right? Uh, but they already have a schema for that. And so we don't, you know, 
force that to change in any way. We just let that get loaded into OPA as data, and then you can write policy over it. So there's no there's no coupling between OPA and these these like the way projects uh, choose to represent their information. Right, and the thing I'll add to that is that you know one of the you sort of want um, both of these things, right? What what you really like is to have a canonical way of writing policy over users. But what you'd also like is to make integration super simple so that you can churn out a whole bunch of these things. And so the question is, how do you achieve both, right? Because if you couple OPA, as, as, as Torn said, and then to the actual enforcement point, well, then you've got to change OPA for every enforcement point. That doesn't work very well. So we've done the opposite, which is to say, well, we're not going to require any sort of schema for users or resources. And OPA will accept any sort of, uh, any sort of, of, of JSON data as input. But then in the, in the policy language, the idea is that it's, it's expressive enough to be able to, to codify schemas or ontologies or whatever you want to call them so that you can still author policy at this sort of, with this sort of canonical nouns, canonical user formats or whatever. And then you just write a little bit of policy that connects whatever format that data comes in as, whether it's users or researchers or whatever, into that canonical schema. So what we do is we sort of try to, 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 to give people the best of both worlds, make the integrations especially simple, but also give people the, the option of writing uh, sort of canonical policies. And so what's, what's sort of missing there is sort of a standard library that says, well, for a spring, uh, for a, a spring integration, then here's how you map the spring user data into this canonical data format. And for a Kubernetes integration, here's how you map the, the Kubernetes user information into that same canonical format. Now, we, we support that. We support that kind of logic, but it's just not in the standard library today. Thank you. Good. Um, I, I have a question. Do you only use the data and the policies as input to the decision, or can OPA call out to other services as well? For example, to do job validation, right? If, if you write that by hand, you would have to be able to call and, 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 and uh, yes. get the certificates to validate and things like that. Right, so the, the right picture in your head is that there's the, the input that comes in, which is shown here. There's the data that you can load from any data source from any kind of system on the planet. And then there's the policy, of course, and then all of that is, is local to the decision. And then uh, fairly recently, we added the capability to within policy, go and make an HTTP call to an external system. Here the idea is, the, the use case here is really one where you can't, for whatever reason, load that data into OPA. Uh, and so what you decide is that I'm gonna take an external, I'm gonna take a dependency on some external service and you know the consequences of that from a performance and availability perspective, I'm willing to take that that availability and performance hit because there's just no other practical way to get the data I need in to make a policy decision. So for example, if you had a gigantic database, it was a terabyte large, well, you're not gonna load that into OPA. Uh, and, it, and if what you know is that on every policy, I only need to make a single, you know, I only need to check if a single row exists in that, in that, in that database, well, then you can use that, that external connector to go out during policy evaluation and check if that row exists. And, and then another thing, have you ever looked into obligations allowing you to manipulate the data? That, that gives you some interesting policy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we've been, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're working closely with Tristan and, and Sarah, and, and they're all, they know all about obligations and advice. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And so, um, the, the plan is for, for in, in OPA today, you can express those kinds of concepts. Um, because, because the policy decisions can be these arbitrary JSON documents, they can, they can, you can include, well, here's the advice and here are the obligations. There's no, um, and, and so, so from the caller's point of view, it, it can, you can return those, that kind of information. Um, there's no first order support though in, inside of OPA to, to do that. That's not a, like a thing that OPA knows about. But in some sense, that's, that's uh, okay as long as you can express the obligations and advice that you care about because it's, the burden is really on the client uh, to actually do something with that advice and those obligations. But, but like I said, um, uh, Sarah and, and uh, Tristan are the experts here and, and we'll learn more as, as we go forward with them in V2. Yeah, I think that um, we're... We're really excited about like that that capability, right? Um, and I think taking that layered approach makes a lot of sense. Like not putting, like we don't need to put all of the 
concerns and how it's going to be used into the policy evaluation itself. In fact, it's stronger if we don't, right? Let's only put the concepts into it that we really, really need to because then it's powerful and can be used across many domains. Right, right. At least that's my current thinking. We'll see. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we're on the same page for, that, for sure. Okay. Um, I do have some lessons learned. I'm not going to go through them because we're out of time. Uh, but I'll leave you with this. <laughs> Star us on GitHub <laughs> and, 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 and participate uh, on Slack. That would be great. So we'll try to post these slides. Yeah, we'll, we'll put them on SlideShare and then put a link in the docs. And okay. if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to hit us up. And yeah, there's lots of people talking about uh, different policy concerns on, on the Slack org. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the time, the, the, the conversation drifts outside of just like enforcement API or, you know, enforce, like data enforcement plane, and it gets into the management plane. And, and so we'd love to have uh, people on there that have experience, you know, with that, um, that, could, that could contribute to the discussion. So yeah, uh, but thanks a lot for, for giving us the opportunity to present here. Any final questions or comments? Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Very informative. Thank you. All right. This was fun. We should do it again anytime. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Torm. I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, helping us uh, establish this use case. Cool. All, right. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>